Welcome to all you firefighters, fire drill firefighters. And to those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to the Fire Drill Friday family where we're building community, learning about the climate crisis and taking action to address it. I'm so glad you're here. You know, each of you can help us grow the movement by sharing today's shows friends and colleagues can join the movement. So if, if you would just take a moment now and hit the share button, because the more people who understand the gravity of the potential climate catastrophe and are willing to act, the more chance we'll have to succeed in minimizing it. Hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Island communities have risen dramatically during COVID, as you know, and last Tuesday's murders are a painful reminder of the desperate need to address both racism and gun violence. We must enact legislation that will advance justice, and, and that means ending the Jim Crow filibuster in order to pass meaningful gun control, as well as for the People Act. So, you know, please do that. And our love and thoughts go out to the families of the victims. I lived 20 years in Atlanta. And when I look at the photographs, I know exactly where those spas are. So we had our first movie night last night. It was Chasing Coral was the documentary. And it was it was really powerful. It was extremely, I got so angry at us human beings for what we are doing to this complicated and precious thing called coral reefs. And um, I'm just so happy by the response to the film. So we're gonna do it again. The last night of, the last Thursday of April will be our next movie night. So stay tuned, but I'm, I'm just so grateful that so many of you were part of it. And you were part of it with, with your family, with your children. I'm so happy about that. Now we have some good news. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> okay, first bit of good news, green, Greenhouse gas emissions in the United Kingdom have plunged by 51% since 1990, and the country is halfway towards slashing its CO2 emissions to zero by 2050. Here's another one. State of Maine is partnering with salmon farmers to reintroduce wild born fish to Maine's rivers. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will transfer two-year-old smolts. Those are little salmon smolts. It's good for crossword puzzles. They're going to introduce two-year-old smolts from their hatchery to open net pens off the coast. There, aquaculture giant Cook Aquaculture, which is a company that operates commercial salmon farms in Maine and around the world, will tend the fish, the smolts, feeding them and keeping predators like seals away for another 18 to 24 months. And then if everything goes according to plan, thousands of adult salmon will be transferred to the East Branch Penobscot and Machias rivers. And there they will select their own mates, find places to spawn and lay their eggs in the gravel giving rise to a whole new generation of wild born fish. I know that during his campaign, President Biden promised he, he would not ban fracking. And I'm sure that there were strategic political considerations as to why he did that. And you know, who knows, maybe he, he actually believes as Obama erroneously did that fracked natural gas would be good, safer, they call it a bridge energy. It would be a safer bridge energy, less damaging to the atmosphere than coal or gas. I think a lot of people view natural gas more favorably than coal or oil because of the word natural in there, right? But you know, natural gas is composed of 70 to 90% methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. 68 times more potent at trapping heat than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. 
Maybe we should start calling it methane instead of natural gas. North American fracking operations are driving the current surge in global levels of methane. And see, methane escapes into the atmosphere from every part of extraction, the processing, and the distribution system at significant rates that exceed earlier estimates by a factor of two to three. Since 2000, discharges of methane gas have risen by more than 50 million tons a year. That's the equivalent to 350 million cars. In addition to the unparalleled damage methane gas does to the atmosphere, Oil Change International says that the impacts of fracking include groundwater contamination and excess water consumption at a time when clean water is becoming scarce, contributes to air pollution, toxic chemical exposure, habitat destruction, increased seismic activity, and health and safety risks associated with heavy tr truck traffic and the toxic and explosive nature of gas and associated hydrocarbons called, this is important, natural gas liquids. Now here's something you might not know. Natural gas companies sell off these gas liquids to chemical companies to make single use plastics, which is triggering a disturbing rise in the number of petrochemical processing plants and plastics facilities constructed in the already overburdened communities in the US Gulf of Mexico and in Appalachia. These plastics are choking our ocean life and often end up being burned in incinerators, adding to climate change and air pollution. For low income communities and communities of color who live near fracking sites, escaping fracked gases cause serious health problems, including cancer, asthma, and other respiratory illnesses, heart problems, and mental health problems. Who knew? There have been many studies of pregnant women living near fracking infrastructures across the country, showing impairment to their infant's health, including birth defects, preterm birth, and low birth weight, which are the leading causes of infant death and developmental issues in the United States. Over the last five years, the share of the country's electricity from methane has doubled to about 40%. Just to put it in context, Renewable energy has also doubled to about 20%. Nuclear power plants have remained relatively stable at about 20%. It's important for us to know, you know how our energy supply is divided up. Utilities are wasting billions of dollars investing in gas plants that will have to be shut down before their useful lives are over because one, our need to rapidly cut carbon emissions and two, are moved to renewables. We already have an excess supply of gas in this country that we can't even use if we're gonna stay within the one and a half degrees Celsius limit of warming that science demands. The same is true for coal and oil. We can't use what we already have. In June, 2020, the University of California, Berkeley issued a report that concluded that by 2035, the US electric grid could get 90% of its power without greenhouse gas emissions while lowering electricity rates. To do that, the country would have to increase its use of renewables, energy storage, and transmission lines while closing all coal plants and slashing natural gas use by 70%. We're moving in the wrong direction, folks. My guest today, Sandra Steingraber, is a PhD biologist. She spoke at the very first Fire Drill Friday in October 2019 in Washington, DC. But as I write in my climate book, to my astonishment, because she's a scientist, she not only spoke, she got arrested on the Capitol steps with me for civil disobedience. And we spent a number of hours in a cell together I mean, scientists don't do that. And then, then there was the way that she spoke at the rally. It was like poetry, 
about what lies between the earth, below the earth, beneath the earth. She said, we blow up a cemetery of prehistoric sea creatures, diatoms and sea lilies and squid 400 million years old that we rename fossil fuels in order to light their bodies on fire in the crematoria we call power plants and internal combustion engine. She made me think about it in a new way, exhuming the ancient sea creatures and weaponizing them so they're now destroying living sea creatures, including the coral reefs we saw last night in the documentary. And as I listened to Dr. Seingraber, I thought to myself, here is a scientist with the soul of a poet. Then I learned she holds a master's degree in poetry. As a scientist, she's focused on the dangers of fracking and how it destroys our drinking water and discharges dozens of carcinogens into our atmosphere. The carbon released by the oil it collects destabilizes our oceans, our food supply, our, our water supply, sending millions of climate migrants in search of safety. She's written a trilogy of award-winning books on environmental health. One of them, Living Downstream, was adopted as a documentary film in 2010. As a co-founder of both New Yorkers Against Fracking and Concerned Health Professionals of New York, she has helped lead a grassroots citizen movement informed by science that resulted in a statewide ban on fracking in 2014. The story of how New York's fracking ban was won and Sandra's role in that fight is told in the 2018 documentary film, Unfractured. Concerned Health Professionals of New York has gone on to provide peer-reviewed science on the risks and harms of fracking to frontline communities, journalists, policymakers, and elected officials all around the world. Its signature monograph, The Compendium of Scientific Medical and Media Findings Demonstrating the Risks and Harms of Fracking, compiles and organizes data from the more than 2000 studies on fracking now in the scientific literature and make it accessible to non-scientists. Dr. Steingraber is one of the principal authors and editors of that report, now in its seventh edition. For her environmental research and writing, Dr. Steingraber is a recipient of the Rachel Carson's Leadership Award from Carson's own alma mater, the Chatham College, a Heinz Award from the Heinz Family Foundation, and from the American Ethical Union, the Elliott Black Award for protecting our planet through science and the witness of civil disobedience. Sandra likes to say that her work aims to inform, inspire, and animate the anti-fracking wing of the climate justice movement. Welcome back, dear, dear Sandra. You certainly inspire and animate me, and I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're taking time to once again join Fire Drill Fridays. It's a real honor to be your guest, Jane. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Sandra. Now, I know that together with concerned health professionals of New York and physicians for social responsibility, you've recently released the seventh edition of the Fracking Science Compendium. Tell us what your new report reveals. <laughs> well, I'm happy to do that. Um, and here it is. This is what it looks like if you actually um, print it out. Um, it's available to everyone else on Concerned Health Professionals of New York website. And you could just Google our name or Google fracking compendium and find it. Um, so essentially, um, well, let me just say what fracking is in a sentence first. So essentially what fracking means is we're, we're taking our fresh drinking water and we're using it as a club to smash the shale bedrock below our feet where oil and gas are trapped as tiny bubbles inside the shale. So this is a completely different way of extracting oil and gas than the old fashioned way, which was just to kind of stick a straw down in the bedrock and you know up comes the bubble and crude, right? Because there used to be big kind of lagoons or blobs of methane and oil that were, um, down there as reserves that we could uh, easily bring to the surface. But 
we pretty much burned through a lot of that now. So what remains are these, um, as you say, fossilized corpses of Devonian creatures that are actually trapped inside the rock. And you have to blow up that rock to get them out. So that's essentially what fracking means. And so when we look at the, um, as, as a collective of um, researchers and physicians, when we scoured the peer reviewed literature to look at the risks and harms of this newish extraction technology, what we found are basically three findings. Uh, and first is that, and most important I wanna say, is that fracking is really an environmental injustice. So the injuries are not borne equally by all of us. Fracking wells and all the infrastructure, which includes the pipelines, the, the flare stacks, the compressor stations, the gas-fired power plants, these are almost always, always located in impoverished Black, Brown, and Asian and Indigenous communities. And that's not because oil and gas just happens to be located under those communities and is not located under rich white communities. It's precisely because those communities don't have a powerful political voice in environmental decision making that, um, and, the, and the industry knows that this is a toxic, dangerous practice that these communities are targeted. When we also found, as you mentioned, that pregnant women and children are most harmed by fracking. And then second is that fracking is toxic. Their human health include cancer, asthma, heart problems, mental health problems. And, and then of course, most terrifying these prenatal problems like preterm birth, low birth weight and birth defects that, that you mentioned. And then thirdly, um, fracking is inherently leaky and therefore it's a climate menace. You know, um, fossil fuels, um, in general, when you burn them, contribute to climate change. But um, in addition to actually combusting the methane, um, fracking is a leaky process right from the moment the drill bit kind of goes into the ground all the way to the gas-fired power plant. Um, and that means that fracking in North America is actually driving right now a global surge in methane emissions, which in turn is driving the climate um, crisis. And actually there's some new research that uh, concerned health professionals of New York is paying attention to right now that will be published soon. And we'll feature that in our eighth edition of our compendium. And this is comes from um, Robert Howarth at Cornell University, who's, who's showing now that about 4% of the methane within the fracking system actually leaks out to the atmosphere. And we already know that anywhere between, let's say, 2.7 and 3.2% leakage rate makes natural gas a worse enemy of the climate than coal. So kind of... Um, it, it's up to us as biologists, I think, to explain to folks against the kind of propaganda of the industry that even though coal is like this black, chunky, sooty thing that just looks dirty, that invisible methane is actually um, worse for our climate, even though it's um, we can't see it, we can't smell it, but the leaks mean that natural, so-called clean natural gas is actually a mirage. So those are our three main findings. Is there no way that fracking can be practiced that doesn't threaten human health and worsen the climate crisis? There's no way, right? And that's our big conclusion, right? There's no way to fix these fracking leaks that are ki both killing the climate and harming the people who live in the fracking fields. I um, mean, that's because fracking is an open system. It actually requires methane leaks and venting of methane to prevent explosions that would kill workers and create real safety problems. Um, so this is like a choice between two terrible things, right? If things can blow up and harm people that way, or you can open the sluices and allow the methane into the atmosphere to keep everyone safe and, and then crash the climate. And so there's no like better plumbing solutions or more rules and regulations that we could pass to make this um, friendly to the climate. Um, also, besides all the pipeline and the infrastructure that's leaky, once you shatter the shale bedrock, it starts releasing methane um, that finds its way to the surface, but also radiation. And that was another one of our big findings is that radon levels in people's basements who live near fracking wells in both Ohio and in Pennsylvania start go going up. And there are actually now, according to a Harvard study, radioactive particles that are released from the wells that attach themselves to dust and then drift downwind 
wind so that people who live 20, 30 miles downwind, and we see this especially in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, are exposed to elevated levels of radiation that they can actually inhale just by breathing. And then there's we have a whole chapter in our compendium about the link between fracking and earthquakes. The data on this are quite good now. And we see also that old wells go on leaking methane and toxic vapors long after they're decommissioned. They're kind of zombies in the earth. They're not um, helping us bring more oil and gas up um, to the surface. But as, they, as the cement begins to crumble and the steel begins to rust, um, they begin to leak in ways that we don't know how to fix. So, I mean, I can just read you um, from our um, compendium conclusion, which says that our examination uncovered no evidence that fracking can be practiced in a manner that does not threaten human health directly and without imperiling climate stability on which public health depends. The rapidly expanding body of evidence compiled here is massive, troubling, and cries out for decisive action. Um, a fracking phase out is a requirement of any meaningful plan to prevent catastrophic climate change. Well, let me ask you this. In California, um, some administrators have said that there isn't enough reliable data on the health hazards of fracking to justify a 2,500 foot buffer zone for people who, who live near drilling. Have your, well, I guess your studies have, have said otherwise. Our studies show otherwise. We find human health harms at that distance. Um, and, and then this new um, research on radiation, which was, has not yet been considered by policymakers, shows us that even you know, 10, 20 miles away, downwind from fracking sites, we're seeing elevated airborne radiation. So um, I um, feel quite certain that the science shows us that um, you, you just can't put these things in places that aren't gonna harm anyone. Yeah. Also, you know, in Colorado, we have evidence that when you try to move fracking operations away from where people live, you end up moving it into our wilderness areas and into agricultural areas, and in some cases into flood zones. So the reason no one lives there is because they're flood prone and you couldn't get you know, homeowners insurance to build a house there. Um, but if you put a fracking site there and then, there, it, then flooding happens, then you, um, you, know, you can have release of all kinds of um, toxic chemicals. We saw this happen during the floods in Colorado. We saw it happen again in the Houston, in the Houston area. So um, we, we looked really hard as concerned health professionals um, all over the world for a regulatory framework that could somehow make fracking safe. And we're here to say, it's kind of like smoking in an airplane, right? There's no kind of retrofits. There are no rules and regulations that would allow somebody to smoke on an airplane and not harm everyone else. So it kind of falls into that category. What, what about, um, there's, there's methods being used in California like Acid well stimulation and steam flooding, are, are these methods just as bad as, as fracking? Right, and so as we run out of these kind of easy to get oil and gas reserves in the earth and we go after the hard to get stuff that just doesn't flow up to the surface on its own, Fracking is kind of the main one we hear about where we're kind of weaponizing our drinking water and using that to kind of as a, a, a sledgehammer to kind of turn the bedrock into shards so that we can get those bubbles of oil and gas out. But there are these other technologies. Some of them are used in California, some in Florida. Um, and one of them is called acid matrix matrixization, which means that very powerful acids are poured down the hole and actually melt the rock away, releasing the oil. Um, and then there are sort of um, cyclical steam methods that um, um, steam the oil so that it's uh, thin enough to kind of come up to the surface. And sometimes that oils can be very, um, well, you know, because you've seen it um, in, in Enbridge Line 3, that the very heavy oils sometimes don't flow through pipelines very well, or they sink to the bottom of the lake. Um, they also have, you have a hard time kind of getting that really thick peanut butter-like oil out of the ground. And so things like um, cyclical steam are used. But remember, whether you're you call it fracking, which is a word that kind of sounds terrible, or you use one of these other technologies to get the oil and grass out of the ground, you're, you are um, creating an open pathway between the deep geological strata and our atmosphere. 
And what the science shows is that if you destroy the shale, you also destroy our atmosphere, right? So fracturing the shale fractures our, our climate. And it's, um, it's like that old um, kind of spiritual precept, as above, so below. In this case, it's like as below, you destroy the, the, the shale as above, then you destroy our climate. That goose flesh. T tell us, Sandra, tell us about your own journey as a cancer survivor and a mother and why we must consider and include mothers at the decision-making table on this fracking issue. Right. Um, well, to speak um, very personally, I was diagnosed with an environmental cancer called bladder cancer when I was 20 years old. And it was my own diagnosing physician who began to ask me questions while I was still kind of lying there exhaling anesthesia about my possible early life exposure to environmental chemicals, because that's the main cause of the kind of cancer that I had. He asked me if I had vocalized tires, if I lived next to an aluminum smelter um, or worked in one. And in fact, there was an aluminum smelter in my hometown. And his questions rightly led me to believe that the explanation and the answer to the question that all cancer patients ask, which is why me, really lay in my early life environment, environmental exposures. At the same time, I was not the first person in my family to have cancer. And in fact, my mother had already been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer when I was diagnosed. So my mom and I were actually co-cancer patients at the same time. And I went on to have kind of colon lesions and my cousin who is exactly my age had stage three colon cancer also as a young woman and so forth. My aunt actually died of the same kind of bladder cancer I had. So I knew I came from a kind of cancer family but here's the other part of my identity. I'm an adoptee, right? So I am not related to um, the Steingravers by chromosomes. Um, and I knew instead as a young biologist that I needed to explain the high rates of cancer in my family and in my community by looking at environmental exposure. So many years later and many postdocs later with the help of Harvard Radcliffe um, and the research I did there, I moved back to my hometown and began um, an exploration of where these excess cancer rates were and where the toxic waste sites were and what was in my hometown drinking water. And that's the story told in, in Living Downstream. And then I became a mother. <laughs> so I became a cancer patient at 20, a mother on the brink of 40, which is kind of an unusual life story. But I began to see that my own body was an ecosystem for my unborn children. And some of the same chemicals that I knew played a role in the story of cancer also played a role in the story of sabotaging prenat prenatal development. And so um, I began to research that. And then all of a sudden, here in upstate New York, came the fracking industry and started leasing up all the land all around me. And some of the same chemicals that I'd been studying in their ability to cause cancer and their ability to cause birth defects and interfere with human pregnancy were part of the story of fracking. And so I began then to use the scientific knowledge I had in the service of, of the anti-fracking um, movement. And what I discovered was there are women and mothers already at the table, like everywhere we go in frontline communities, women and mothers are leading this fight. Because I think we know um, that when when something is inherently dangerous, we have an obligation to protect our children from harm, right? Like we don't need absolute proof that um, if we let our children swim in the lake and there's um, lightning on the horizon, that our children are gonna get electrocuted. On the basis of the precautionary principle, we you know, call them out of the lake and we make them wear bicycle helmets, not because we know they're going to crash, but just on the off chance that they might, we act in advance of harm. And so I see mothers and women looking at the emerging data on fracking saying, look, the, the 2000 studies we already have look pretty bad. It's just wrong to use our children as kind of guinea pigs in an uncontrolled human experiment, exposing them to radiation, exposing them to benzene and all kinds of other um, chemicals that fly out of the fracking wells or that um, d uh, contaminate our well water. And so um, as a biologist, I can bring a certain skill set to the table. But when I go to that table, I see that there are all kinds of other women, especially Black, Latina, and Indigenous women already at that table. <laughs> and these are the voices that we really need to be listening to. I think that we should try to get those 
right to lifers, you know, those people that demonstrate outside Planned Parenthood who care so much about fetuses, why aren't they part of the anti-fracking movement, right? Doesn't well, I think they're, I mean, we, I obviously am on the other side of that kind of cultural divide. I mean, as an adoptee, as so many adoptees are, we recognize that there's so much um, secrecy and deception in the industry that's adoption that is often predatory. We, we, my own um, original birth certificate is uh, falsified and my own ability to access my family medical history is denied to me. And so I'm very firmly in a pro-choice camp as most everyone in the, in the um, who are adoptees are. However, looking across that cultural divide to people in the right to life camp, there is a conversation to be had. And I have had that actually, especially in the state of Pennsylvania, um, with w women who are whose animating issue is the sanctity of fetal life. I mean, I see the same thing as a reproductive issue as a, as a woman and a mother, but they see it in, in a different way. But there is a common ground there that we can organize around um, and that can be very, very powerful. So I'm, I'm open to that. Great. Thank you for telling that story, Sandra. Biden has pledged to not ban new fracking on federal lands, which means that he'll allow already existing fracking um, uh, to continue and won't ban fracking on private or state lands. Do you feel that he can be persuaded to change his position with the new evidence that you have that's so damning to methane and to the fracking process? I, I do. Um, I, I, I definitely do. And it does look like Biden can likely suspend fracking on federal lands, right? So his um, January 27th order that paused oil and gas leasing on federal lands kind of does the trick for now. Um, that affects different fracking communities differently. Like that has a lot to say about fracking in North Dakota, for example, where so much land there is federal land. However, it won't do much for fracking in the Permian Basin, which is kind of the, the big shale play, as they say right now, in um, um, southern and western Texas and New Mexico, because there's not, like the state of Texas came into our, uh, became a state of the United States with almost no federal land, right? So that won't help very much there. But Biden could also, in addition to going after the, the you know, the, uh, the public lands that belong to us and prohibit fracking there, he could also issue regulations such as clean water and methane regulations that would make it um, in de facto um, prohibit prohibitionist, right, to, um, for companies to frack nationwide. Um, and that, um, that piece could really help us stop fracking on lands that aren't public lands. And, and the, another key thing here, I think, is to recognize that fracking has never actually made money for investors. It's a capital intensive kind of, uh, what do they call it? Like a Rube Goldberg kind of apparatus. It's very primitive. It's got a lot of moving parts um, and it, it requires high prices in order to, to be profitable. Um, but as renewables scale up and gas fired power plants now are more expensive to operate than actually building new renewable systems. Um, and that's, that means that for natural gas to be competitive in the new market, it has to have low prices, but that you can't frack with low prices and make any money for investors. So there's been this big rush now to redirect fracking away from like sending it to a power plant to light it on fire to make electricity and instead send it to two other different sectors, um, the petrochemical industry and then liquefied natural gas, which is meant for export. So LNG is a way of using cryogenics, really cold temperatures to turn that invisible vapor that is um, methane into a liquid and that causes it to shrink by a, a factor of 600. And then you can put it on ships and send it abroad. Um, and this is now driving this petrochemical boom that you mentioned. So all of these single use plastic bags are coming at us, not because we've all demanded more plastics, but because the fracking industry owes a lot of money to Wall Street and has used its uh, so-called proven reserves as collateral. And it has to get this out of the ground and make money um, or they're in trouble and so are their investors. So that's what's kind of driving this. And happily, I can say that there is now an uprising against all this, especially in Appalachia. And I think listeners should really pay attention to this. Um, there's a citizen uprising in the Ohio River Valley. It's being led by this amazing group called 
um, mid Ohio Valley Climate Action in Ohio, and then in Pennsylvania um, by um, Better Path Coalition Pennsylvania and by No Petro PA, um, because they don't want to become you know, Appalachia should not become the plastic bag and petrochemical manufacturer to solve a waste disposal problem um, for the fracking industry. But ba back to Biden for a minute, there's also something else he could do. So in 20, 2005, under the um, George W. Bush administration, Congress actually exempted fracking from a whole lot of our federal laws, including the Safe Drinking Water Act, because essentially fracking can't operate according to the rules and laws that govern all other industries. Like you can't, if you were doing anything other than fracking, you couldn't just drill a hole through an aquifer and pour toxic chemicals down that hole. But fracking is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act. So it gets a pass and it can do that. And that's called the Halliburton loophole. So if you actually close that loophole and started enforcing uh, on the federal statutes around fracking, that would, and, and also started regulating methane seriously, that would, um, pretty much make it very hard to frack. Wow, thank you for that. I, this is really great. We, we have our work cut out for us, but it's becoming much clearer about how we're gonna handle fracking. He doesn't have to just come out and say, you know, I'm gonna ban fracking. He can just simply make the regulations really work. That's right. And that's kind yeah. of the model we used in New York, right? We. we had a moment where our governor um, didn't know what to do about fracking, whether to prohibit it or to permit it, and so declared a moratorium while studies went on. And so, I mean, the word ban is just a word, right? We just don't want fracking. And so there, are, I think, many paths up the mountain. And, and we eventually in New York did get a ban. I mean, science did prevail. And uh, concerned health professionals of New York is just really grateful that we played a role in bringing the science and in helping to inform that decision. Um, but I think there are ways of shutting down the artifice that is the fracking industry and protecting people and protecting our climate um, without having to in use the ban word, which um, um, is is just a word. Politically fraught. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that, Sandra. Um, as I think I told you, I was just last week in northern Minnesota trying to bring awareness to um, what the Canadian Enbridge oil company is doing with its line three, bringing tar sands oil down through Minnesota. So would you, um, you at the last uh, Fire Drill Friday that you attended in DC, you talked about the Enbridge gas pipeline that was threatening Weymouth, Mass. T tell us, Massachusetts, tell us what's, um, what's been happening there. Um, because there are people in, the, in that neck of the woods in our, in our audience, and I have no love for Enbridge. So tell us what's happening. Well, first, I just want to thank you so much for going to northern Minnesota. Um, not a lot of people know that I actually did my dissertation research there. And there's a story behind that that I'm publishing um, in a piece I wrote for Orion magazine. Because after I got out of the hospital as a young cancer patient, I wanted to go far away from aluminum smelters and toxic places. And I saw a flyer um, in the hallway of my ecology professor you know, outside his office about Lake Itasca, headwaters of the Mississippi, this beautiful place that was preserved by the state of Minnesota to be a primeval forest. And there was a biological station there. And so I went there and um, as an undergraduate and then went back as a graduate student and actually did all my research there. So it's a very a personally sacred place for me. So when I saw you there, I immediately recognized it. And it's just a heart break to think that this company called Enbridge is building a pipeline um, under and through um, uh, Ojibwe land, but also the headwaters of um, our amazing Mississippi River in this place that where I actually became a biologist, right? So I care deeply about that. Well, in the meantime, the same company Enbridge is at work in a little town on the south shore of Massachusetts called Weymouth. And Weymouth is um, near Plymouth. So it's the kind of the less famous cousin, but that goes way back to the pilgrims. It's actually the birthplace of Abigail Adams. Um, and it's a rough and scruffy little town. It is, um, uh, there are a lot of Asian immigrants who live there and it has become over the last eight years, a kind the David and a David and Goliath fight. And I have to give the people of Weymouth so much credit. They are the best slingshot makers <laughs> in the, um, 
in the fight against the Goliaths that are the, you know, the oil and gas Philistines, right, of our time. And so in this highly industrialized environmental justice community where they already have so much exposure to toxic chemicals um, in Weymouth, now Enbridge comes along and wants to site a compressor station there that will push fracked gas from Pennsylvania all the way north into Maine, but also into Canada. And here's where the story gets all complicated and it's why we say, you know, it's all one big pipeline, right? That's what we like to say in the anti-fracking movement because these things are all connected. So in Nova Scotia, the gas that the Weymouth compressor station has pushed up north becomes part of another project called Goldboro, um, which is connected to a company called Pierre Day, um, which is going to be turning that gas originally from Pennsylvania, also probably from Alberta, into LNG, liquefied natural gas, and sending it abroad to um, presumably to Europe. And now that company, that second company, Pira Day, is threatening legal action against anti-fracking activists who reveal the contents of leaked documents showing a finan financial instability in this company and its attempt to seek actually almost a billion dollars of public funds in order to do this whole exporting apparatus thing, right? And so that's where this whole project is connected to, and one of the linchpins is in the little scrappy town of Weymouth, where there's been this eight year fight where citizens calling themselves um, fracks, the, uh, the, the, the compressor station is along the Four River, F-O-R-E, and frac stands for Four River Residents Against the Compressor Station. Um, and so in this densely populated town, they are objecting to this thing this accident prone, toxic thing being plopped down into a densely populated area full of Asian immigrants where thousands of kids go to school within the blast zone. And they have done their organizing work so successfully and partnered with scientists who have revealed that actually in the environmental impact statement that supports this thing, um, a lot of data was left out and there was this kind of whole shell game that was done to make it look less dangerous than it was. And now the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that regulates these things is actually maybe taking another look, even though this compressor station is already up and running. And they're like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's interests, even though this thing is going already, has spooked the entire fracking industry. Um, so there's going to be a really interesting um, uh, it's very interesting drama that's being played out and so many um, congratulations and um, just, you know, we should all just be throwing roses at the, the, the good people of Weymouth for leading this fight because they're, it's really a, an example of how citizens can take science and scientists and citizens can work together to reveal the deception and the harm of this um, very toxic thing that's not only um, locally menacing their own community, but is part like connected to this whole international scheme that is hurting indigenous people in Nova Scotia, a fight up there that's being led by women, um, that's harming people in Europe when this stuff gets um, exported there. And there's this now, um, we're on the verge of a plastics boom in Europe because of all the exporting of gas and so on. And so thank you people of Weymouth for leading the charge on this. You're really showing us the way. I want to go there when we're free again. Let's, to go let's go together. Yeah, I've stood I with want to go there. there. Maybe yeah. you'll come with me. Yeah, I will come. Yes, okay. let's go. <laughs> Two more questions. You know, most scientists are not activists for all kinds of reasons, and you are. You once said scientific objectivity for me is not the same as political neutrality. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think those thing, two things are different, um, objectivity and neutrality. And I think that a lot of people conflate the two. And to me, they're very separate. Um, and all, like every biologist and every scientist I know, I'm a huge believer in objectivity. And when I have my scientist brain working and I'm looking at a whole bunch of data, then I am just letting that data talk to me. 
I'm looking at the sample size, I'm looking at the statistical stability, I'm looking at how it's graphed and whether what would this look like if we graphed it logarithmically, and I'm looking at sort of black dots in white mathematical space, and it's telling me a story that as a biologist I'm trained to understand. Um, and that's being objective. At the end of the day, if my objective analysis shows that people are being harmed and the climate is being harmed, then um, as a scientist, I still have a moral responsibility because I'm also a citizen to um, take whatever I know that might be harming future generations, indigenous people, um, the people of Weymouth and act on that knowledge. And that's where it's not politically neutral, right? But I think scientists throughout history have had to behave in ways that aren't politically neutral. They, they need, we need to, what I call, speak data to power, right? Take our data into the halls of Congress. I spend a lot of my time um, giving testimony before state houses. Um, this summer, I um, spoke for uh, in favor of the ban fracking bill, um, which is being co-sponsored by um, AOC herself on the in the House and um, Senator Sanders in the in the Senate. And so I have something to say about that because of my objective analysis as as, as a scientist. Um, so I think what we a lot of us became biologists not simply for in, just purely intellectual reasons. I know I became a biologist for the same reason I'm a poet, which is like that it be, being a biologist helps me understand the mystery of being alive. And so does poetry, but it's just two different ways of looking at the world. And, um, and, and it's not just because we think life is, you know, intellectually interesting. It's because we want to protect it, right? We want to make the world better. And so sometimes scientists have to act in ways that are not politically neutral in order that the objective analysis speak. Because if, if science should inform policy and laws, I sometimes think of it, Jane, like um, as embroidery, oddly enough, because my dad, my adoptive dad was a soldier in World War II. And he, you know, by 18, he was having to confront Nazis. And I wear his name, Steingraber, really proudly for that reason. Um, and he had what we now would under, understand as PTSD. And the way he dealt with it when I was a kid was through embroidery. He did, he made, pictures with needle and thread of um, like big eyed children and pets and um, little uh, cottages um, with animals. And so clearly he was using his skills as an embroiderer to create a world that was safe that he wanted to live in. And, the, and his embroidery was all over my house and in my, on the walls of my bedroom. So I learned to sew <laughs> from my dad. And also that's how I became a biologist and did animal surgery for a while. But so now the way I think of science and law is that like science is the embroidery scheme. It's actually a pile of yarn that just sits in the corner, right? And then we need to take that embroidery and create laws from it. Um, we need to create a picture of the world that we want to live in. And so the hands of the embroiderer that takes the, sci the science and turns it into law, into law and policy, like who is that? Who are the embroiderers? Who gets to do that work? And scientists are some of the people that are called upon to do that work. And there are others, there are faith leaders and attorneys and all kinds of folks, right? Um, but all together, it's like, we are all part of a big quilting bee and we're creating the world that we want to live in with the rules that we want to govern it. And, and the, the thread that we're using is scientific evidence. You're a great metaphor. Thank you for that. And my final question for you, Sandra, you know, in my recent book, uh, my climate book, What Can I Do? I, I quote what you said about learning to respect our underground ecosystem. I, I was so deeply touched by that. Would you tell our audience what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, and this, I should say, is the topic of my current and ongoing book project. So which began as a poem. <laughs> Sometimes my science begins as poetry because I began to realize that here in New York, we were having this huge battle over what to do with this layer of shale a mile below our feet that no one had ever seen called the Marcellus Shale. 
And I love the word Marcellus, like my poetry self really liked the word. And Marcellus turns out to be a character in Hamlet. He's the one who says to Hamlet, um, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark, which seems very resonant to me. And Marcellus, before he was a character in Hamlet, is a character long ago in ancient Rome, who was a military general who was so prideful that he got impaled outside the gates of his own home city um, in some battle because he was just um, pride goeth before fall, right? Which also seems to me <laughs> a, uh, a metaphor for fracking. And so I began um, with this line of, from Julius Caesar in my head, actually. It was just, somehow Hamlet led me to Julius Caesar, right? The line that says, um, I th I'm just, who says is Brutus maybe? Um, Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. That was the line in my head during the whole year, years we were fighting fracking. Oh, and we were fighting about this landscape no one had ever seen. So I'm really interested in writing now as a biologist about that landscape where all the oil and gas is held. As you so beautifully said in your introduction, it's like an ancient cemetery of all of these Devonian sea creatures that turned into bubbles of methane that are trapped in this rock. Right. Um, but it's also a living ecosystem. And that's what I'm really interested in now. So there are living organisms at that depth that are feeding on the dead bodies of these ancient sea creatures. And this current crop of living guys, are the, a lot of them are belong to a domain of life called Archaea, which means the ancient ones. And they form very complex colonies. And they're down there kind of rearranging the habitat to suit themselves, as all creatures do here on the sunlit surface of the planet. And, and they're so, in some way, uh, and you, know, you can Google deep life organisms and read about them, and, or extremophiles as another uh, kind of functional name for them. And in some way, they are connected to us here through pathways I really am interested in explicating because some geologists believe there may be, they're so ubiquitous by biomass, there actually be, be more deep life organisms than there are living things here at the surface of the earth. And if, and if that's true, it means they're playing a role in the carbon cycle. Um, and there's some connection between them and what's happening in our atmosphere. And again, sort of as above, so below, as below, so above, we're all connected, right? So I'm going to let the science lead me in helping readers to see and helping us to change change the narrative that this this shale layer that has all this oil and gas in it that isn't that doesn't have to be like the basis for our energy system what if that's a living ecosystem what if it's like a subterranean coral reef that's living like literally metabolically alive i'm not talking about like mother earth or gaia or kind of metaphorically but there are living organisms down there that we have to destroy in order to get fracked gas um, and fracked oil up, right? That's one reason fracking fluid is so toxic because very powerful biocides are added to fracking fluid to wipe out this whole living underground ecosystem because those creatures can grow inside the pipes and interfere with the flow of oil and gas. So I'm really interested in the natural history of those creatures. And because we can't go down there with a camera and do like a Nova special, I'm gonna to have to deploy everything I know as a creative writer and everything I know as a biologist to use language to make visual um, what that world down there is like. And that, that may be our well being here at the sunlit surface depends on our preserving and honoring and respecting that life rather than blowing it up and getting those um, fossilized corpses out. So that, that's kind of my new work. So beautiful. I, I'm glad you made the, the parallel with coral reefs. It feels like some kind of one mile beneath our feet, a world that is like a coral reef, building on itself. You're, you're a pioneer. I Listen, you audience, the people who are... What? <laughs> what? I think you might need to write the introduction to my book. That's exactly a sentence that I like. <laughs> um, all of you who are watching, I know that you will forgive me for not leaving time for your questions, but th this woman is, a, is unusual. She's very special. And I just, um, I know you understand that I just, I needed the time to ask her these questions and she needed the time to answer them. And it doesn't leave time for your questions. And I'm, I'm so sorry, but I know that you'll forgive us. Um, 
Thank you, Sandra, for such a, a rich and important conversation and for all your amazing work, your work that is so driven by profound empathy for humans and for the natural world. And before you go and before you, the audience goes, now there's a story from the front lines. I, I really want you to see this. This is a segment where we devote five minutes to hear from someone on the front lines fighting for climate justice. It's, it's a way to, to get out of our heads and into our hearts, which I think we're already part way into our hearts because of Sandra's stories. But today we're gonna to hear a powerful story from right here in California. Uh, last year, Governor Newsom chose the pandemic <laughs> as the moment to lift a temporary fracking moratorium and issued 128 new fracking permits. Nearly two and a half million Californians, overwhelmingly black, Latinx, indigenous, and working class communities live within half a mile of an oil or gas well, many of which use fracking or other extreme drilling techniques. In addition to contributing to the climate crisis, as you've heard, um, extreme drilling and drilling close to communities is a real public health crisis and Californians really have to urgently address this. Our storyteller is Juan Flores. Juan is the lead organizer for the climate justice campaign at the Center on Race, Poverty and the Environment. He's leading organizing efforts to end fracking and other extreme methods of oil extraction, as well as efforts to achieve a comprehensive state law that will provide a 25 foot buffer zone from oil extraction in California communities. The bill is SB 467. Juan also works on CRPE's just transition efforts for oil workers to move to clean, safe, and unionized jobs. Let's, let's listen to his story. Hi, my name is Juan Flores. I'm a community organizer for the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment here in Kern County. In 2012, as I was getting ready to do the groundbreaking for a, an organic community garden, um, we were all celebrating. And 30 minutes into the celebration, we noticed that there was a, a smell uh, on the air and a lot of us were actually having headaches. A local farmer, uh, Tom Franz, who was there, uh, pointed out at an oil well about three to, to, to 400 yards away from us. And he said, uh, you see what, what, what's happening on that well? They're doing hydraulic fracturing three to 400 yards where we were. Now, next to us, literally next to us, there's an elementary school, uh, Sequoia Elementary School. And, and I couldn't believe it. But, but then the local folks said, this is very normal. Lately, we have seen a lot of these oil wells pumping up, uh, popping up uh, really close to our community. And Tom Fran said, yeah, this is the, it's a boom of, of fracking, right? So, uh, about three to four days later, I went back to the community garden and there were about six boys right next to the fence of the school looking at the gardeners and, 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 and looking what they, what they were doing. And so I got close to them and I said, uh, how do you guys like uh, gardening? And, and, and we were talking, you know, and, and we were talking about the, the possibility perhaps of their class coming over to the garden and learning a little bit. And one conversation led to another. And I asked the six boys, I said, how many, how many of you have asthma? And, and they looked kind of like surprised, you know, like what a question, right? And, and one of them looked at me straight into my eyes and said, you don't have asthma? That was a heartbreaking answer to me. I, I said, you, you're telling me all of you have asthma. And, and they said, yeah. One of, them, one of them explained to me the routine that he has to go uh, through every time he gets an asthma attack. He says, he said, I, I get asthma attacks two to three times a month. And I, I know that the first thing that I have to do is I have to, to find the nearest adult or the nearest phone so I can call 911. And I know that it's going to take anywhere from five to seven minutes 
uh, for the ambulance to arrive. And between those five to seven minutes, I have to remain as calm as possible. And, and the one thing that I do to, to keep myself calm, it's I sing on my, on my head a song that my mom used to sing to me when I was a baby. That, 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 was, that was a choker, that was impressive. So I, I started talking more and more to community members, right, about this fracking boom and, and how they felt in their community. And they said, well, they said, the majority of them said, look, we feel kidnapped. When they are drilling, when they're fracturing these wells, we're not able to go out. We're not able to enjoy our evenings. Sometimes we're not even able to sleep <laughs> because there's so much equipment being moved, being moved around the, the, the town. There's some drilling in the middle of the night. Then during the day, you have these really bad smells and we really can enjoy ourselves. That has been the story of fracking in Kern County. That has been what our community members have to put up with, right? And, and we hardly talk about that, that besides the physical health consequences, about the psychological and uh, academic challenges that is posing for a lot of our children. Imagine that young little boy that had to spend two to three days a month in the hospital. Those are two or three days that he has to miss from going to school. At the end of the school year, that amounts to a lot of days, right? His possibilities to be able to make it to university are being held back because of an industry that has come into the town, that has really taken upon their space, their academic life, their religious life, their family life, because they're not able to enjoy themselves. That's what communities have to suffer on a daily basis, just in chapter. Then you have the farm workers who said, look, and besides all of this, we also have trouble with the produced water that, that is being uh, accumulated because of fracking. All of this produced water is being sold to the farmers and our crops are being irrigated with. So we're exposed to this water without any testing, without any scientific studies, to, just to say one, that we as workers are safe. And two, that the consumers at the end are gonna be safe. And this is a problem that does not stay only in Kern County. The Central Valley is considered, considered a food basket of the nation. All of the fruits, vegetables, nuts, citruses that we grow here are literally exported everywhere in the nation. 25% of the food basket of the nation is grown in this valley. And there's a high chance that many of those products are being grown right here in Kern County and sold to the rest of you nationwide. Fracking is dangerous. Fracking is killing our people. Fracking is holding our children behind. It's a moment that we say enough and that we put a stop to fracking. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. You're so right. We have to stop this. Thank you for sharing your story about the reality of the, the suffering of people in Kern County and communities all across California because of fossil fuel. There's no better word than enough, as you said. It doesn't have to be this way. We Californians have a chance to curb extreme drilling and fossil fuel environmental racism. We can take action today to stop this dangerous practice. Last month, California State Senators Scott Weiner and Monique Limon introduced Senate Bill SB 467, a bill that would end fracking and extreme drilling techniques in the state of California, while mandating a 2,500 foot buffer zone for frontline communities living near drilling. Other states, including New York, have banned fracking. And California, a major oil producing state with its reputation as a climate and environmental leader, must do the same. So for all the Californians watching today, we're asking you to call on Governor Newsom and California state legislators to support this bill, 467. You can find all the details by going to firedrillfriday.com slash take action. 
And for everybody, as we've been discussing, we're putting all the pressure we can muster on Biden to stop perpetuating the dangerous and dying fossil fuel industry through federal subsidies. The gas industry alone receives subsidies to the tune of roughly $15 billion each year. Go to firedrillfridays.com slash take action to sign a petition that demands that Biden cut the fossil fuel subsidies out of the government's budget for good. If you've already signed it, share it with a friend. We'll be delivering the petition to Biden next month and need everybody's votes. And before I go, I wanna tell you one more thing. Um, we have to take urgent action if we have any hope of preventing the most catastrophic effects of climate change. So for Earth Day next month, we're focusing, we're hosting a very special youth episode that will be focused on the future we're fighting for. For the next few weeks, we wanna hear from the young ones in, that are part of the Fire Drill Friday community, your children, your grandchildren. We're inviting each of you to share what any little ones in your life think about climate change, okay? Film their answer to the question, what is climate change? What is climate change? And another question, if you were in charge, how would you fix it? Film them answering those questions and then upload the video to any social media platform with the hashtag climate kids. Thanks again to Juan and Dr. Steingraber for joining me today and helping the whole Fire Drill Friday community understand what we're up against and what we're fighting for. I'll see you next week for April's virtual rally. It's the day after April Fool's Day, so it's gonna be really fun. Stay safe. And don't forget to take time this weekend to welcome spring. Mwah.